What is going on, everybody? John Stamper from Dental Cast Productions, and I am so honored to be here at the Productive Dentist Academy event in Dallas. And we wanted to get this thing kicked off and bring on a special guest, somebody that hopefully I would imagine all of you know, Victoria Peterson. Victoria, good morning. Hey, good morning, John. It is so good to see you, and we, we got kicked off this morning. You got everybody excited with, with a warm message, and I, I have to be honest with you, uh, very touching, you know, because I know you haven't seen these people in a while, right. and uh, so talk about what it was like just to just to be in front of everybody again. Well, first of all, if you're watching it live streaming, hello, I wish you were here. Um, we're back in Dallas. It's been one year, seven months, two weeks, three days, and two hours, but who's counting <laughs> since we were able to just yeah. love on people and that whether it's a fist bump or a hug or whatever. And so walking to the front of the room, we have 185 attendees here, which is just incredible. We also have a secondary conference going on with sleep group solutions. So our, our doctors are learning about sleep apnea plus productivity and the teams are back. And when I stood in front, yeah, this is what you're talking about. Like my eyes started watering. I could just, you could feel the yeah. love in the room. And I know that sounds corny, but there is so much hope and courage and yeah. celebration yeah. and acknowledgement in that room you could feel it so i kicked off the day by crying and <laughs> hey i well i think that's what struck me is that you know you shared with everybody which i thought was such a poignant moment to thank them for their courage yeah right and and in a lot of ways i think the courage to you know to be here the courage to help them get their teams through what what it's been like the last 18 months uh i just i thought it was very special well i it's such a heartfelt thing to witness to see dental professionals put themselves in the front line. I mean, yeah. I know I know people who are stocking grocery store shelves. They're essential workers and they're front line. But you know what? The the big news is that dentistry was there. Yeah. And even even though it was shut down, so many doctors and their teams were willing to come in in the face of all of that uncertainty and treat emergency patients to redefine what emergency was, to redefine care, to redefine um, how they could serve. Yeah. And their patients responded too. And instead of saying, hey, just fix the worst one, I was like, hey, doc, can you take care of everything? So I think dentistry transformed yeah. um, in what we could expect from ourselves and what our patients expected from us. And that was the courage that we were really acknowledging this morning. You know, it's interesting too, because yes, we know that dentistry was shut down, but it was not shut down for long, right? No. I mean, I mean, there were obviously different states and different practices that were shut down a little bit longer than others, but the practices had to get back with their patients pretty quickly after yeah. everything happened. And we, we work coast to coast. I say we were from Honolulu to Nova Scotia. So <laughs> <laughs> having to learn the regulations in yeah. every uh, state. Like Dr. Wade Kiefer's on our faculty. He could only have one person per provider in the office at a time. So as a dentist, he, he's used to working out of two or three chairs. He couldn't have a second patient getting numb mm -hmm. while he finished and dismay only one person. And he remained productive, yeah. right? And so how do you retool the scheduling? How do you retool the team to really keep the doors open? So we worked through that. We had a, a lot of clients in uh, Brooklyn and New York area, which was hit really, really hard early yeah. on, stayed closed probably longer, and they still found ways to serve. Yeah. You know, it was incredible. You know, I've heard a lot through all of this that uh, practices had to uh, learn dentistry in a different way. They had to lean on their teams. They had to uh, really rip everything away and, and focus on the foundation. And right. when I think about what you all do at Productive Dentist Academy, can you talk a little bit about what it was like from your perspective on the work that you did and have done with these teams before all of this yeah. and how you think that was able to help them? Just something to lean on. There were still a lot of unknowns for everybody. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying, just they were able to pull from, I'm sure, a lot of the things that, that you guys have worked with them on. I would say that there was a stark contrast between um, doctors who had really invested in their team and then their growth. Yeah. It's not just, um, I had a better benefit package, right. which that's important, but it, what we saw was doctors who truly respected their team members and they gave them authority and autonomy and respect in their roles. That was the team that showed up. Yeah. And that preparation ahead of time 
really is what got them through because there was a lot of concessions and accommodations. Mm -hmm. uh, you have children, you stay home, I'll work. Right. So a lot of job sharing and co-sharing started taking place in a new way. Hygienists are suddenly doing collections. <laughs> like that. I was a hygienist. I did move to office manager after that, but it was like, that's a whole different skill set, right? And so the teams that had prepared for any occasion was ready for this occasion. Yeah. And that's what we talk about in having an investment grade practice. It's a, yes, it's about the money and financial success and freedom, but it really is what makes you investable. Yeah. And when you think about secure investments, you really want to invest in your team. Yes. Because the, stati the stability of your processes depend on the people who run them. Yep. Right. And so that was uh, a big difference that yeah. we saw. Well, I know also. Uh, you and Bruce were, you were everywhere, even during the <laughs> pandemic, whether it be, I mean, you mentioned it this morning when you, when you had Bruce come up, just all of the webinars and, and, and you continue to stay connected. Uh, your team uh, is amazing. We have had an opportunity to just, you know, I know you brought them up today and all the things that they've had to do to kind of keep this going. Uh, let's shift a little bit from the dental practices to what it's been like for, for you and Bruce and just your team to, to hold everybody together, right? Because I mean, you, mm. you you are all usually known for being there for, for your practices. Right. And then sometimes you've got to, you got to look inward and have the strength to be able to take care of, you know, your amazing team. Yeah, there was a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, in 2018, we started working on this process. And in 2019, we actually transitioned to an ESOP, which makes us employee owned. So if you ever meet anyone who works for PDA, they're my partners. Yeah. Those are my business partners. Yeah. And we really wanted to acknowledge them in that way. So that kicked off in July of 2019. So we're just starting to think about what is an ESOP? What does it mean? How do you have authority? How do you gain voice from the team? We had 40 employees, 28 were in a 4,000 square foot building in Anacortes where our headquarters is in Washington. And, um, then we, Bruce and I went off to speak in uh, Australia. So we're in Melbourne and we, we were just cruising and going around New Zealand and suddenly we're on a cruise ship in New Zealand and we hear uh, there's a virus in China. Oh and every port we went to, everybody was wearing masks. And we thought, this is kind of crazy. And we even got sick on the ship. We, yeah. we had respiratory distress, but we came off. That was around February 8th. And we held our event here in Dallas in February and then the country started shutting down in March yep. shutting down shutting down shutting down and so now suddenly we were half virtual so we had experience being yep. virtual but we had 28 team members who were in cubicles in an ad agency you know writing copy and websites and all of this and we had to figure out how do we send everybody home and checking out workstations and reshuffling and we never took a day off from client service yeah. because everything was still in real time for the client. So we would shuffle these three and then we would get those and we, we retooled. We eventually closed down two thirds of our physical space. So now we're down to a thousand square feet. We're completely virtual. We keep a hub for shipping and for Reagan and, yeah. and, and conference room, but it was a huge change. Yeah. Um, also a change for me personally, we've been snowbirding between Washington and Hawaii and <laughs> Crimea River, we had to stay there. <laughs> so we I know, I was just telling you, I see it all the time. Every time I, I was telling Victoria, I uh, see you coming from Hawaii and I just uh, love it that you're there, special place. I just have a longer commute, that's yes, all. Yes, that's all it it's is. It's just a longer commute. <laughs> <laughs> what? What have you seen that a lot of the practices that you all work with, uh, what are maybe some new things that they've learned through all of this? You know, I really want to speak to the female entrepreneurs out there because I, um, one of the conferences that I did speak in in March of 2019 was with Grace Yum at her CEO roundtable. And that conference uh, got reduced from 25 people to five. I said, I'm coming. I have a ticket from Hawaii. I have other things to do. Like I just, I was, I was clueless. Yeah. And Grace said, okay, well, we'll see if anybody wants to show up. And watching the women that were there, we really just threw out the agenda and said, what is it going to take to be a leader in these times? What's it going to take to be a female leader in these times? You know, if we have children and this and that, and that, that was another big theme that we saw was uh, family 
rose to priority yeah. for our team and for our doctors. And with so many female entrepreneurs, trying to be everything to everybody had to stop. You had to prioritize and what I saw were, I, I'm so proud of men and the women, but the women in particular, yeah. they finally got in here in their heart space and their gut and they said, what are my priorities? What are my values? What do I stand for? And the ones that did that, it was almost like they snapped into a grid and everything just fell in line. I'm not saying it was easy, yeah. but it was easier to say, I'm going to the office, hubby or spouse or yeah. mom or parents, they learned to reach out for help. And one of my phrases, this came from my coach, Kendra Thornberry, success requires support. And I think that's one of the things we discovered is that success requires support. It's right. not a weakness to ask for it. And then the gift of it is the more support you surround yourself with, the more successful you become. So it, it almost like reshifted the energy and it's like, oh, I've got people around me that'll do things. I can <laughs> ask for things. So I think the self-worth of teams went up. Yeah. I think the self-worth of our doctors went up and they were, they were okay being vulnerable. Sure. They were okay asking for support. I know one of the other things that, that, that you all talk about uh, is uh, something of an, an investment grade practice. Yes. Right? And so again, I think uh, a lot of eye-opening for, for many practice owners across the country during all of this to really look at, okay, do I still love what I'm doing? You know, where is my practice? What stage is it in? Can you talk about that a little bit, the concept of the investment grade practice? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm in the middle of writing a new book. Uh, it'll be a hardbound book. It's taking all that I have learned in my entrepreneurial career, uh, going from my my parents were entrepreneurs. I never thought about getting a job. I just knew like you're going to you're going to be scrappy and you're going to make yes. your way in the world. And I became a hygienist. I was very entrepreneurial in that. I did my own recare, reactivation. I booked my own business. I was on commission and I loved it because I was in control of it. So when I became a consultant, that was hardwired into me. And over 20 years of consulting, I then decided to buy dental practices. I thought it would be fun. That was literally my word. This will be fun. <laughs> and I learned that as a non-dentist owner, buying a dental practice is like buying a boat. <laughs> right, 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 right. You love it the day you buy it and the day you sell it. <laughs> and so I really had to be attuned to what brings value yeah. because I knew I was coming into buying practices with an exit strategy in mind. And most doctors don't do that. Right. Um, the American Dental Association tells us that 95% of dentists cannot retire and maintain their lifestyle. Yeah. And I won't get into the sad stories, but I had quite a few people reaching out um, that were very desperate times yeah. during this. And it brought up a lot of emotion for me. Um, people who were deciding that it was easier to cash in the life insurance than it was to struggle through another day and leaving behind their families. And doctors who literally were just handing the keys or walking away and hoping somebody would come in. I saw a lot of chart sales and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. So if you have at least two years on your horizon, I can help. If you have five years, it's even better. If you start the process from the beginning, yep. you're gonna be golden. And again, that's what we saw is most dentists operate on cash flow. Yep. There's money in the bank, I'll go spend it. There's no money in the bank, I'll freak out about right, it. Right, right. And that's not a strategy. So uh, in the book and in the podcast, we've just launched a new podcast a couple of months ago for investment grade practice. Yep. And I bring in people from around the country, some in dentistry, most outside dentistry that are true business yeah. uh, professionals, interview them. And then I do a monologue. So it comes out twice a month. There'll be a, a guest interview and then a monologue on that topic. So It's so important. And, and as you know, I think to that point, there's such a fine line between a practice owner looking at their, their practice as their lifestyle business, right? Yes. Because, and, and I think when you bring that up in the entrepreneurial world, we always look at, you, you draw a line in the sand. Is this a lifestyle business or am I, am, am I going to sell it? And, and, and I'm so glad that, that you're focusing on that because, like you said, uh, a practice owner could have this lifestyle business, be enjoying it, and then yes. be three, five years away and say, wait a minute, like I thought I was doing the right thing with right. Not, with, without thinking about that. So right. that's And that's actually the tagline, investment-grade practice, 
building a, a life you love today yeah. and an asset to sell tomorrow. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter what your timeline is. Yeah. So another thing, uh, you guys are always working on exciting things. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the Dental Festival. Yes. Uh, and I know that um, you, know, you, you all have meetings across the country in a lot yep. of these different markets you know, where, where you work with practices. Uh, talk a little bit about that, something new, and kind of what your plans are there. Yeah, it's exciting. So we got a, um, I was invited to participate in Dentistry's Got Talent uh, in April. Thank you, Elijah. That was amazing. And also sat on the Dental Tank panel. Yes. So I loved being an investor and advisor to young entrepreneurs who were looking for seed money for their companies. Um, I was so impressed by that conference and what was happening there that we've committed to being there in October. Yep. Now, I know it's a, it, with the rates going up and yep. if you turn off the news for 10 minutes, you figure out it's okay. Um, we're going to be back October 12th. It's about 30 minutes outside Miami. It's not in the hub. It's in the Diplomat Hotel. It's mm -hmm. very safe. It's very secure. Yep. And Bruce is going to do our clinical calibration course. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Baird will be there. Dr. Jeff Booski, who actually yes, won Dentistry won. Got yes, Talent. Yes. Jeff is going to be Phenomenal. there. I'm going to be there. We have Sarah Hansen, who's uh, one of our marketing consultants, is competing this year. And we hope to see a lot of new faces and new friends down there. Um, the topic that we chose was clinical calibration because um, if I can give you one point on improving productivity is get in sync with your team on what you diagnose. Yes. Like what is your thought process? When do we do this? When do we do that? 80% of the time. Yeah. I can deal with the 10 to 20% outliers, but getting everybody in sync from medical history to risk factors, to the patient conversation, to how we document it, those kind of processes. So we're going to walk through that core piece of PDA, which is diagnosis by risk factors and right. helping your team get in sync with that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, years ago, I sat in a training session where there was two dentists talking about, you know, how they treatment plan. Yeah. And I was fascinated because I thought, or I just assumed uh, that both clinicians, if they were working in the same practice, would treatment plan the same? No. And it, it, no. it was amazing to me. And then, of course, I was sitting there, I thought to myself, their team has to be, wait a minute, like, who do I listen to? Like, right. you know, he diagnoses it this way, she diagnoses it this way. So, I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was working with the doc once and I said, what's your perio protocol? And he said, it depends. <laughs> and I said, on what? And he goes, well, Mary is kind of old school. She doesn't do a lot yeah. of perio. Yeah. And, and Bryn, she's newer. She's really all about it. Yeah. And I said, so what's your perio protocol? And he goes, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and the team is like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we want to follow you, but it's, it's the hard. tough cases to Mary because, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, yeah, getting your philosophy of care and really committing to it, it's another one of those things that really snaps to the grid. And if you're having challenges with the team on getting on the same page or there's a lot of drama and I don't want to do it and passive aggressive stuff, this is the one area that will align yeah. everybody in the team. Yeah, there's no question. So uh, you have spoke uh, all over. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to watch you in person and just absolutely amazing and captivating the audiences. This new world that we live in, you mentioned you know, the podcast and a yep. lot of things that you've done. Uh, talk a little bit about that. I mean, I mean we're going to kind of um, look at the future a little bit of dentistry yes. in this new world where, yes, people are coming in person, super valuable, but there are opportunities for dental professionals to learn mm -hmm. um, from individuals like yourself and others that are, that are interviewing more. Talk about that and kind yeah. of your excitement about that moving <laughs> forward. I get really excited about that, particularly given that I have to have a six-hour runway just to get to the mainland to then fly yes. somewhere. Yes. Um, we actually launched, uh, we're in our fourth iteration of it, Business Impact Foundations. And this course uh, is a leadership course for doctors, and we walk through eight weeks of going through all the things we've talked about here today. What's your philosophy of care? How does that impact the patient journey? How does your team need to be trained in each of these areas? What's your two-year business plan? What's your roadmap? And how do you update that quarterly? So things like that is, I love online for that because we meet weekly for about an hour and a half and you really get to know the group. So right. we do it in small group. We do breakout sessions, so maybe you're just you know, two or three people and, and you get to know your peers. So it's a very safe place for doctors to interact. And I think that has tremendous value over live interaction right. because it's sustained over time, it's convenient, and you really get to know each other. I've been amazed 
that through our masterminds and our peer learning, how much um, connection there yes. is between doctors. They yes. didn't feel so isolated. Yes. Um, live events, though, I think that in person here or in your office is when you really want to shift behavior. There's, there's an energetic when yeah. you're live that the emotional thread carries through and you get a different result. Yeah. And so I think the academics and some camaraderie are really great online. Um, I have had people do conga lines online. I've had people, um, I've done some fun things with the Do Conference. Hi, Ann Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ann. She would shoot us both if we didn't say hi to Ann. <laughs> That's right. Got to give her a shout out. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I've hosted virtual conferences. I've been a speaker on virtual conferences. Uh, for Do, I, yep. I hosted a business panel yep. for the Do. That was really powerful and incredible. So. I love that. I'm also really jacked about all the artificial intelligence that's coming into. Yeah. I think it's really going to come along as my brain cells like download. <laughs> and so, you know, I want to download myself now and some right. little AI version of it's Victoria yeah, is yeah, out yeah. there. Like you said, yes. Maybe my avatar will live on long after me. <laughs> <laughs> I some love that. Meme world. <laughs> so I have always known you to be uh, positive person, uh, you know, a real person, but I think someone yeah. that just has good common sense insight for everybody that, that's out there watching. When you look at the next couple of years in dentistry, mm. where, where, what, what is Victoria Peterson thinking about? Two things. One, I think that the, the footprint of DSOs in corporate dentistry will continue. Um, it's no surprise. I'm not saying anything earth shattering here. And I think there's never been a better time to start or build or grow your own practice. Um, robust, private, independent practices are thriving. And I, um, some groups I'll say that and they go, oh, you just work with dinosaurs. They're gonna, and I'm like, they're not gonna die out. I don't think that dentistry is gonna go the way of pharmacy right. and or physicians. Yeah. I think there's always gonna be a thirst for high value, high customer service within our industry. Yeah. Um, I think our workflows are going to be radically different. I see outsourcing uh, coming into the mainstream, finding uh, those things that can be done, taking the burden off the front desk, taking some of the overhead burden off the practice. I think that's incredible. I love all the technologies for collections. And as a marketing group, as an ad agency, I certainly love all the analytics that we can get like this that used to take... Forever. 15 spreadsheets <laughs> yes. And, yes. and four people, yep. you know, to try to figure it out. So I'm, I'm really loving the automations. Yep. It's encouraging because I think that everything is timing, right? And when right. I look at dentistry and I look at the amount of resources and companies right. that are there to support the individual dental practice uh, gives them that bandwidth, right, yes. to still do what they want to do and not feel like they have to be a part of a lar larger organization. So I, th I think that's key. And I think... You know, we had an opportunity this morning. You you spent some time with your educational sponsors here. Yes. They were very excited to be here. Yep. Uh, I'm looking forward to a lot of the conversations that they have. We are going to be speaking with all of them. So to Victoria's point, uh, a lot of some of those great companies and their new technologies, they will be with us. Uh, any final thoughts for your audience and, and anybody out there? We love you. <laughs> <laughs> and so excited to be back. And... Um, if I had that word of wisdom, it would be that success requires support and being really congruent with what you're looking for helps you cut through the noise. Yeah. Because like you said, there's a lot of new things coming and you've got to be really grounded in who you are and what you want to accomplish so right. you know, is it correct for you? Right. It's not about right or wrong, but what is correct for me? And that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. You get to yes. do it your way. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, Victoria, thank you so much. Um, congratulations on everything that you guys have done to build this amazing organization. Uh, and for those of you that are watching that have not had an opportunity to go to an event in person, I'm sure most of them have, but if you haven't, you know, be sure to look uh, more up about what Productive Dentist Academy is doing. And we will be here, like we said, for the next couple of days, showcasing you a little bit of a snippet of what it's like to be at one of their events. So congratulations, always a pleasure, and thanks, thanks for John. joining. Thank you.